Fusion, the international science radio show. Fair enough. Uh, uh, my name is Dr. James Hayes, and I'm a researcher at UNSW Civil and Environmental Engineering, um, specifically at the Oda Laboratory. How do humans smell? Well, um, humans smell uh, much the same way other mammals do. So what happens is that we have a sheath of um, neurons, brain cells, uh, called olfactory receptor neurons, and they're within our nose. Just underneath that, we have a mucus layer. Typically, we personally experience this mucus layer when we have a cold or a flu or something, and it tends to go a bit haywire. Um, and what happens is that particular chemicals go up our nose when we sniff, and it's a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle. So you'll have a particular receptor with a particular chemical. They will link together, and that will elicit a reaction that goes towards the brain. And does the brain do extra processing the way it does for vision, where it sort of contrasts wavelengths to give you a sensation of colour? Yes, um, it's very complicated, unfortunately. Well, fortunately for me. Um, so we have about uh, 5 million of these olfactory receptor neurons, ORNs, um, and that translates to us detecting about 1 trillion distinct odours, um, which is quite a number. Um, it does all sorts of things. So the example I like to use is if you have a look at a fruit bowl and you might have lemons and strawberries and cucumbers in this very eclectic fruit bowl. Um, now the number of chemicals within all these um, different fruits is variable. And, you know, if it was just a very sort of, um, you put, you get out what you put in, all you would do is smell these different chemicals. But what you can really do is say, I smell lemons, I smell strawberries, and I smell cucumbers separately, even though some of these chemicals might even be the same chemical. Um, our body, our brain is capable of processing that information um, very, uh, very, it's very complicated, and we still quite, don't quite know how it works. <laughs> and some people can't smell things at all, and some people can only smell things sometimes. Yes, so we ha uh, there's, a, there's a couple of conditions. There's anosmia, and anosmia is a complete lack of smell, uh, uh, the sense of smell, we call it olfaction. Um, this can happen a few ways. It can be genetically based. It can happen through disease. It can also happen through injury. So we have um, the signal that comes from um, our olfactory receptor neurons. That goes through a part of skull in the brain called the cribriform plate. If you have an injury to your head, those neurons might shear off, and then you've lost your sense of smell. Um, it's interesting because olfactory receptor neurons and uh, the whole sense of smell in general, uh, it's the only neurons that regenerate and grow back very quickly. These neurons also grow quickly, but they don't know how to go back through the same holes um, in the plate, um, unless you're very fortunate. Um, you also have hyposmia. Um, this is a, uh, an inability to smell certain odorants. This typically happens through environmental factors. So for instance, I did a paper a very long time ago now where we, I looked at uh, smoking, and smoking does affect your overall sense of smell, but the chemicals that are within the cigarette itself are affected even worse off. Um, and that's because um, you have these um, odorants bombarding those particular receptor neurons all the time, and those neurons uh, basically don't regenerate as fast as what they should. Wow, so that, there's a lot going on there. And of course, you, you're actually an engineer. So you've got a whole laboratory at working on odours and what they are and how people react to them. Yes. So um, my career started off as a psychologist um, and I got my, my honours in psychology. And uh, then I moved over to engineering to look at sort of the way communities might uh, behave to particular odorants and that sort of thing. So, yeah. <laughs> and so there's, there's obviously quite a lot going on there that people have really strong reactions to some odours and others yes. we barely notice or, or others we really like. Yes, yes. Um, so we still don't really have an explanation for why you'll have uh, two neighbours sitting next to each other. One will experience um, a bad odour and they'll make complaints about it. They'll be very upset about it. It will affect their, their way of life almost and the neighbor next to them won't even notice or care for it. Um, we still don't quite know why that happens. Um, we've got some theories, but nothing, nothing really uh, that strong. 
Because there are people with things like um, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia who get so sensitive to perfumes and deodorants and other chemicals in the air that it makes them ill. Yes, that can happen. Um, that can also happen to people who aren't uh, experiencing any particular illnesses. Um, you have people called uh, super sniffers, colloquially, where they, where, um, they can smell things uh, very well. Um, but it doesn't even need to be that. It can be someone with an average sense of smell and they're just affected very strongly. The other um, large quadrant of people that we find who are affected very adversely by smells are people with po post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, in America, you have a lot of troops returning from conflict. Uh, these conflicts have particular odors. And unfortunately, those odors are similar to some industrially produced odorants. And that will actually trigger um, very poor um, flashbacks for these, uh, for these individuals. So people form associations with odors and particular situations and events. Yes, uh, olfactory memories are actually our oldest type of memory. So newborns, the first thing they start with is an olfactory memory. Um, they tend to be the most enduring type of memory, uh, more than visual or verbal. Unfortunately, it, you can't really learn for a test with olfaction. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, you can say something like, do you remember the first time you had a strawberry? And most people are going to be able to give you some sort of explanation as to when they first had that. Um, and as a result, yes, you have a lot of associations with particular odors. Um, if you smell a perfume of an ex um, as you walk past, you'll probably have flashbacks of particular memories. Um, I've heard that's uh, an argument for why men don't like going through uh, cologne shops and things like that, because it's just too much. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a common occurrence. <laughs> Oh, let me think. There's there's so many things going on there. So, is there also a genetic component for things like um, the durian fruit? Is one of those ones where some people, <laughs> I mean, most people apparently find the smell bad, but some people find that doesn't affect how they enjoy the fruit, and some people can't stand it. Is that related to your sense of smell? Do you think that is a hundred percent your sense of smell? Um, however, this isn't typically modulated by genetics, although some things are. Um, for instance, the classic example is coriander, and for some people, coriander tastes like soapy dishwater. Um, that is determined by one gene, and that one gene is not working the way it should. Uh, with the example of durian, it actually has to do with uh, culture and perhaps a little bit of ethnicity as well. So people who grow up in a culture of uh, eating durian have those memories from their childhood, and as a result, they're more comfortable with eating it. In fact, uh, some scientists developed a non-odorous durian a little while ago, and they released it back to the countries that typically eat it, and it didn't sell very well because they associated that odour with, uh, with uh, pleasant memories of eating the fruit. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and so how do you measure these sort of things? Well, um, it's, it's a little bit complicated. Um, please let me know if I'm getting into too much detail. You have several measurements. You have olfactory threshold. Olfactory threshold is essentially um, the point at which a concentration increases and you can say, I can smell that or I can't smell that. You can't necessarily tell me what it is, but you'll have an understanding of um, that something is present. Then you have something called olfactory discrimination, um, OD. And OD is the ability to say that one odor is different to another odor. And then you have olfactory identification, and that's classically saying, I smell strawberry, I smell lemons, I smell meat, whatever that might be. They're the three basic measures. We also have other things like uh, olfactory hedonics, which uh, rates the pleasantness of a smell. We also have olfactory intensity, which judges the intensity of a particular odour. What I find particularly interesting about that is that olfactory intensity is usually quite a basic scale. It just goes from 0 to 10. But the vast majority of people, um, everyone, if you mark a seven, chances are the person next to you will also mark a seven for how intense a particular odor is. And that's one of the very few things about your sense of smell, which is fairly similar across all people. Wow. And so how good are we uh, at discriminating? If you've got, well, if you've got an odor that you don't like and you add a deodorant, <laughs> Yes. Does that overwhelm your sense of smell so you don't smell the bad thing? Because that's how it's sold. Yes. Well, 
the problem is is that that doesn't really work. Um, so yeah, deodorants. Um, I'm sure there's other mechanisms involved, but the typical mechanism is is that here's a lot of very strong odorants. They're not unpleasant or pleasant. They're just kind of neutral, but they're there, and they'll overload your olfactory receptors. Unfortunately, the odors that we typically find unpleasant, so the ones in body odor and things like that, um, they involve a lot of sulfur, um, H2S, and all the things that come from H2S, dimethyl trisulfide, dimethyl disulfide, I won't go on. Um, these are all unpleasant, and these are all things that our brain is hardwired to identify at very, very low concentrations, because in our evolutionary history, sulfur um, comes from rotting meats and things like that. We're trained to avoid them. So it will work for very small concentrations, but if it gets any higher, chances are you're still gonna be able to detect uh, the body odor um, and other unpleasant odors. And we're talking concentrations of parts per trillion, parts per billion, like one part um, will be enough for us to detect it and be uh, put off by it. So the deodorant's not quite gonna mask it? It's not gonna mask it if you have a strong odor. Um, if you have some mild odor, the odor day to day, it will probably do um, a, a good job. Um, if there's other factors involved, um, I don't have a huge understanding of how deodorants behave, but um, BO in particular, um, it's not formed necessarily by yourself. You exude particular oils from your skin and this, these oils are digested by bacteria and those bacteria let off these particular odorants maybe a deodorant could kill off those bacteria for a little bit. Um, that's certainly possible, um, uh, things like that. So yeah, it will work for minor odors. It's not gonna work for anything um, that approaches significance. But for people with uh, body odor, um, if you wait a couple of weeks and you're in a scenario where everyone uh, isn't using deodorant and everyone isn't taking showers, you'll adapt to that pretty quickly because your body, uh, your brain I should say, is quite adept at noticing, yes, this is an unpleasant odor, but I can ignore it. So for example, um, at one point I was up in the, um, the snowy alpine regions um, and we got snowed in and um, the, the shower had frozen, everything was frozen. We had to stay up there for a couple of weeks. We all had unpleasant body odor, but we got used to it very quickly <laughs> until we came back down, of course, and then we furiously had showers. And you mentioned uh, the community. So what are the, what are the implications for community with odour? What, what happens? What's your work in that area? Sure. So I've looked at particular industrial areas, um, uh, industrial placements that produce uh, different kinds of odour. Um, typically, what we're looking at are industrial placements that are environmentally beneficial. So certain types of recycling and that sort of thing. So to me, that's, that's kind of my passion right now. Um, the impact of odors is controversial with communities, but I think it's important to acknowledge their concerns because if you think about it, unlike a particularly unpleasant visual experience or an auditory experience, these things tend to be not very permanent. An odor can stick around, it can invade your home. You might not really feel that you have an escape from it. And so it does have the potential to cause some very seriously aggrieved community members. The extent to which um, there's been certain facilities in Australia and definitely abroad where community outrage has closed them down or severely limited their, um, their processing. Amelioration efforts to like get rid of the odors for those processing plants, um, that can go up to the hundreds of millions of dollars in some instances. So it's a very important thing for industrial production. Um, typically, uh, lots of recycling, landfill, lots of animal produ uh, production, um, certain primary uh, products as well. Um, so it is, it's, it's, a, it's a big concern. Typically, odors account for about 50% of all complaints for most indu industrial sectors. Um, and yeah, the, the complaints can be, uh, can be a really big issue. And is that something that industry is working on to improve? Oh, absolutely. So uh, at the, in the odor lab at uh, UNSW, we're working um, collaboratively with a lot of different industries, um, in particular um, 
uh, drinking water to ensure people are comfortable with drinking water um, and other water facilities. And they know that odors are a big issue. And we, we're working very, very hard to uh, ensure that we encapsulate the community experience as best as we can. Um, and what, we can, what we're trying to do at the moment really is turn that community experience into feedback to the industry so we can say, okay, well, at this particular time, these community members are experiencing these kind of odors. Now, if we go back, look at how the, um, how the, the particular product or whatever it might be is processed, we can then say, oh, it's this particular process, we can change that. We can do something to make sure that community members aren't experiencing that. Um, and that's something I, I feel really happy about. <laughs> And let's see, what can we go on to? Um, what about the differences in the way people perceive things? Is there a difference between the genders? Yes, um, there's quite a noticeable difference. Women tend to be able to smell odours uh, and detect odours better than men can. Um, and they can detect a wider variety of odorants. Um, they also tend to hold on to their odorant, um, their sense of smell ability is a lot longer than males. Both of them tend to degrade at um, 60 years of age. Uh, for men, this degrades a lot faster. Um, there's other influences, uh, environmental ones, um, like smoking and being in particular environments, cultural ones, um, and uh, ethnic ones. So for instance, people within a Japanese culture and possibly arguing Japanese ethnicity have a very hard time detecting aniseed because that's not a part of um, their food or um, culinary experience at all in Japan. Um, and so they have a harder time detecting it and they certainly don't perceive it as a food, unlike some people do in Europe. Uh, I think it's about 50% of people like licorice and about 50% don't. Um, there's other influences. Your belief in how good you are at perceiving affects your ability to perceive odors, which is, bending the mind a little bit, but that does happen. Um, uh, your sort of attention to odors. Um, so for example, myself, um, I've been trained to work on particular um, analytical machines at the odor laboratory. As a result, I have to be trained to be able to identify odorants and characterize them in a particular way. Um, and that means that my abilities to perceive odors are probably a little bit better than the average person's. Um, and honestly, some of it is just up to luck of the draw. There is a huge amount of variability in um, the public space and a lot of that variability, we just don't know where it comes from. And wine connoisseurs have a, a smell training sort of regime that they go through where they yes. learn to detect a wide range of particular scents. So it's something you could train up. Yes, it is something you can train up. In fact, we use the, exactly the same machines they do, except they're looking at wines and we are looking at uh, the leavings of a particular industrial plant. Um, so I think they get the better, the better end of the stick in that regard. But yes, it is something that you can train. Um, you can have training um, programs. There is a phenomenon called the tip of the nose phenomenon, where if you're given an odor, but you don't have any visual uh, reference to it, you've you struggle to characterize it. It's just something that everyone has because we typically don't pay a huge amount of attention to our sense of smell. Um, so a lot of the training is overcoming that particular uh, issue. So I guess, it, is that to do with the way we think that if we can label things, we can more easily remember them and identify those experiences later? Yeah, that's one part of it. And I think the other part is just paying more attention to it. So for instance, if you're in a room and you're reading a book and there's a ticking clock in that room, uh, you can switch off your attention to that ticking clock and you can forget about it. Uh, much in the same way, I feel, if you begin to pay more attention to your sense of smell, it becomes a more important part of your overall experience. Fascinating. Um, and what about, what is it that generates body odor with people? Like there seems to be such a variation is it, yes. is it infection or is it just a thing that we naturally do? Or, and well, I won't go on too many questions because that relates to things like pheromones. Ah, now the pheromone debate has been going on for as long as I can remember. Um, do you want to talk about pheromones first? Let, let, let's say, 
What do you think about pheromones? Do humans detect them? <sighs> okay, huge debate. And I guarantee it that if anyone hears this conversation and they know anything about uh, olfactory science, they will probably be angry with me. I'll try and go <laughs> through it as, uh, as painlessly as possible. Um, so pheromones are not technically a part of your olfactory sense of smell system. It is a different system called the vemoronasal organ. It's still in your nose um, and in other creatures, it does indeed detect pheromones. We have one ourselves. It seems that it doesn't do anything. It just sits there. <laughs> as far as we're aware, it, it's, it's useless, it's vestigial. Um, that being said, uh, there is a fair amount of research to say, so um, a lot of people argue about the definition of what a pheromone is. So um, a lot of people would say like, so moths, when they want to breed, they will exude a pheromone. That pheromone can be detected at very small concentrations. Other males come up to it. Um, if you include the definition of pheromone to include individuals, then you might say that we have pheromones. So newborns, will smell their mother's milk and will smell their mother's odor and they will definitely know it's their mother more than anybody else. Is that a pheromone? It's at very small concentrations. It might go through the pheromonasal organ. It probably doesn't. Does that count? I personally say no. I'm sure a lot of people would say yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, the other area of controversy with pheromones, of course, is sexual attraction. Yes. And if it's not going uh, through that organ. <laughs> no, look, that there are certainly that there are certainly odors that improve sexual attraction, especially so um, one of the classic examples is is that if you take um, particular body odors from siblings um, and then compare so like a sister and a brother or another relative, um, and the woman sits down they'll smell a particular odor from a relative or something like that. Even somebody they don't necessarily interact with that much and they compare it to a stranger, they tend to prefer the stranger. So there is something there. There is something saying that odors or pheromones are um, saying, um, you know, don't, don't uh, interact with this person. They're not a good breeding partner. There is something in that. Um, and there are certain colognes and uh, smells that can be associated with manliness or womanliness. Again, is this, is this like a cheat system? I, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. So more generally, um, what's happening in our bodies, if it's not a sp special smell gland or, or, or anything like that going on, what makes us smelly? Uh, what makes body odour? Yes. Or, um, okay, so body odor is typically formed with um, uh, sebaceous oils that we release through our skin. And there are particular bacteria that eat these oils and they will, they will excrete particular chemicals. They use, tend to be um, sulfurs. And as I mentioned before, sulfurs are something that we're very uncomfortable with. The other thing is, is that there are certain um, foods. Um, the classic one is garlic. Um, and if you eat garlic, the body odor that you're exuding through your pores, that's not really garlic. That is actually something called allyl methyl sulfide, which is when your body is converting all that garlic into something else, it releases a sulfide. We don't like sulfides in our body. We get rid of it somehow. And that's typically what happens. Um, again, this is very culturally based. Um, a lot of people coming from Asian countries smell Europeans and Australians, and we smell like uh, off cheese or rancid milk or something like that, because we have a lot of dairy and that's something that they're not particularly accustomed to. Um, I'm sure you can think of lots of other examples in this regard. Um, so it's very often a cultural experience about how bad a, a body odor is. Um, let me think. So I'm trying to think what we haven't. Um... Oh yes. So there's, suggestions from various regions that certain scents will make you certain odors will make you more aware or more relaxed or or have different effects on your mood or your feelings is that all just cultural and experience association or is there an actual physiological effect somewhere there there's a psychological effect so um using classical conditioning um you know with the 
with little Albert and everything else. And I won't go into little Albert because it's kind of sad, but if you associate um, a particular stimulus with something else, so the, the other classic example, of course, is ringing a bell and dogs begin to drool because they know when they ring the bell that they're going to receive food. If you have a particular odor and you're doing something in particular, um, that will, that will basically cause your brain to get into that mood. So what I like to do when I'm studying, I'll have a particular odorant. I like orange, for instance, I smell sniff a bit of orange and that tells my brain I'm ready to start uh, thinking properly. Um, with regards to doing anything beyond that kind of classical conditioning, I haven't found anything in the research myself. Yeah. And there's talk of, you know, dogs having, you know, an enormously stronger sense of smell than humans that they could detect disease if they're trained. Yes. So um, I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll try and describe just how good dogs are at uh, sniffing things. Um, so we have about 5 million of those smell receptors, olfactory receptor neurons in our brain. That translates us to an, um, having about 1 trillion odorants. Comparatively, dogs have 200 million olfactory receptor neurons, and that translates to about 40 trillion odorants if we're just using, like if we're just extrapolating. Because to be honest, we don't know how much they smell, can smell things. We don't know at what limits. They are far beyond the limits of our best analytical machines. They are probably far beyond the limits of what we can reproduce in the laboratory. Because at those levels, you don't know if you're causing contamination and things like that. They are very, very good um, sniffers. Um, can they smell disease? Yes, they can. Um, this typically has to do with them noticing variations in a person's odor. So they will say, it's a, a, going back to the strawberry. So a strawberry consists of about seven separate chemicals at different concentrations. They all combine together to create the idea of what a strawberry is. We think, although we can't be certain, that dogs have the same thing. If they smell these particular odors in a particular concentration, they can say, this is a type of cancer, or this is a, another sort of disease. They've recently trained dogs to detect COVID-19. Um, and it won't probably be from the virus itself because, I mean, they're not really odorants, but it will probably be um, the body giving off certain chemicals as a part of the response to, um, to COVID-19. Um, the other um, good example is, is that without training, dogs can typically detect when um, their owners are about to go through um, a, a shock or some sort of seizure due to diabetes, um, and they smell sweet, and they'll start licking the owner to let them know that something's going to happen. Amazing. And, of course, controversially is... Uh police sniffer dogs because there seem to yes. be studies showing that they pay more attention to what their handlers want than what they're smelling. This is true. Um, there are ways of avoiding it. We do find that um, there's laboratory, I was about to say lab, but I think I'd confuse it if we're talking about dogs. Um, there are laboratory tests which show dogs are exceptionally good sniffers. When that translates to an um, uh, real world setting, they tend to do a fair bit more poorly. Um, this can be a variety of reasons. Um, if it's a training procedure on the part of the handler, then there's certainly potential to fix that problem if, if that's what it is, but we don't really know. Um, it could be cues that we're, not un that we're unconsciously providing to the dogs. It could have something to do with their training regimen. It could have potentially something to do with the environment and they're missing cues in a way that we just don't understand yet. Um, again, because testing with dogs is so challenging, answering these questions requires a huge amount of um, very careful um, and considered approaches. And uh, we, we kind of need to do that if we're going to improve detection dog outcomes. And of course, with COVID-19, one of the symptoms that some people report is a loss of smell. Yes. Um, I, I read about this a little while ago and I was quite fascinated. So typically what happens with most cold and, and flus, you will have a person um, start off, their mucus will kind of build up and accumulate and get cloggy and that'll stop chemicals getting to those receptor neurons. 
um, and then it'll get progressively worse. With uh, COVID, your sense of smell just shuts off immediately, um, really aggressively. The reason for that being um, is that you have special structural cells that keep up your receptor neurons um, and the inflammation response from your body causes those cells to inflame and not do their job properly. So it's kind of like um, pitching a tent and then having the tent poles kind of fall around you and uh, not doing their job. And that's what happens. Um, fortunately, it's also been reported that your sense of smell does return once the virus has left your body. Because there were reports that, um, well, there were suggestions in the press that it was uh, the smelling parts of the brain rather than just the senses in the nose that were going a bit wrong. That seems unlikely. Um, there, is a, there is some very interesting research in looking at how the um, olfactory senses of the brain can be used to measure certain um, mental ailments and things like that. So... Uh, for instance, there is a smell test that is very accurate, uh, more accurate than trained physicians to say whether someone has high functioning autism or Asperger's. And this is based upon um, people smelling a suite of odorants and the way in which that they react to particular odors and assess their intensity gives what we like to call an olfactory signature. Um, and it'll look like a little graph. And we can say with that kind of signature, this person probably has Asperger's. Um, it's also used for a variety of other things. I mean, I think, I think the core thing to understand for this is that um, olfactory receptor neurons are brain cells. All of this is going through the brain. So if there's something wrong um, or uh, different mentally, then you, um, you can use uh, neurons to check that. Uh, in fact, there's a researcher a uh, research group led by McKay Sim um, down in the south of Australia, and he's um, extracting olfactory receptor neurons um, uh, completely from the nose, and he's running tests on them, putting them under the microscope, and that's also providing um, some diagnostic abilities for certain mental ail ailments. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, that particularly, well, that relates back to the earlier question I had about um, where a sense of smell can cut in and out, you know, yes. absent for a while and then suddenly there and then suddenly gone. And that could be something yeah, well, in the brain. Yeah. Um, um, a loss of smell um, is actually a very, very good predictor of um, imminent uh, loss of life. Ooh. Uh, it has a five year prediction for mortality. If mm. you do find yourself un for some reason losing your sense of smell, um, I recommend going to a doctor. And this has things to do with the fact that because these um, ol olfactory receptor neurons keep um, growing back, there's something wrong with the cells regenerating um, and that, that might imply that other things are happening with the body that uh, you might not be aware of. Goodness. Would you go to see a neurologist or an ENT specialist? Um, I don't think I'd go to either. I think I'd just go to a, a doctor because it, it'll be. predict things like something's wrong with your heart, something's wrong with your liver. Um, just, just have an all round check because it could be all sorts of things. <laughs> well, that's a good one for people to know. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think what other topics, um, I haven't asked you. Is there anything I haven't asked you that, uh, would be interesting to discuss? Um, we can talk about, uh, we can go into a little bit more detail about how olfactory receptor neurons work. Oh yes. So we were talking about how we can say we can smell lemon and then we can smell strawberry. Um, what I like to describe it as, and I'm sure you have some musos listening to this. If you think of a keyboard um, and uh, the smell of lemon is just one chemical, limonene, and that's like just pressing a single key on the keyboard. Meanwhile, uh, you have things like chords. So the C chord consists of three separate notes. They're played at the same time. And when you detect it in your ear, you're not really hearing three notes, you're hearing just one note. Um, and that's how strawberry behaves. Strawberries consists of seven separate chemicals and they all have, need to have a particular concentration um, at a, a particular um, interaction with your olfactory receptor neurons. And that will produce one, uh, let's call it note of strawberry. And uh, that's how a lot of chemicals work. That's how we can extrapolate from just 5 million 
olfactory receptor neurons into one trillion separate odorants. Um, and once that smell goes, so in an evolutionary past, um, we devoted a lot of our brain power to our sense of smell. Um, over the years, uh, because we've become apex predators and all, all, all other sorts of things, our sense of smell has become less important to us. So those parts of the brain um, are where emotions now exist. Um, as a result, uh, when you smell things, they still go through those parts of the brain. And that's why we have a very strong emotional connection to perfumes and colognes and we have such an aversion to body odor because it has a, an emotional uh, characteristic to it that no other senses really have. That's amazing. <laughs> a whole heap of uh, different um, ways to use our sense of smell. And it's, it's not invasive. Um, it can be trained. And uh, I, I think it has a lot of uh, implications uh, for the future. That's wonderful. Um, I think we've got something like five, six minutes left of your hour. <laughs> if you, is there anything else or, or have you got through most of the things you'd like to discuss? Um, I could talk about the history, I suppose. If you'd like, I mean, that could be interesting. Yeah, so the reason that, um, well, this is one of the main reasons, and this is one of the main reasons I hate this particular philosopher. Um, Aristotle called uh, the sense of smell the most base of all the senses, not worthy of our attention. And I think that's kind of translated throughout the ages. And I think he's got a lot to answer for. <laughs> um, later on, um, obviously, you had a uh, sense of smell used by uh, doctors and things to identify certain diseases and disorders. Um, the, uh, the example of, um, oh, I can't remember his name now, but his work... Uh, was uh, preceded by Jon Snow looking at the, uh, a particular pump that had typhus. And the idea at the time was that it was bad odors that were causing um, people to get ill and not the diseases themselves. So I'm not saying that um, your sense of smell is completely without fault. Um, it, was a, it was a dominant theory at the time that that was what was causing the bad things and that was just not the case. Um, and I think, I think recently... Uh, your sense of smell, because of its non-invasive quality, uh, will find itself in more applied to medical uh, issues. Um, there are things where um, they're taking these odorous compounds that we personally might not be able to detect. People are breathing into tubes and things like that. And you can say they have a particular lung cancer and things like that. My wife um, works at the Colling Institute and she looks at breath research and she doesn't look at VOC, she looks at proteins, but the uh, practice is quite similar. Um, so I think there's a lot of applications for the future. And if we can just shake off what Aristotle said all those years ago, I think we'd be a lot better for it. <laughs> um, would you like to make any other concluding statement or are you happy with that one? <laughs> um, I can give you some interesting facts if you like. I can oh, say sure. what the worst, worst odour of all time was. Yes. The worst odor of all time is something called thioacetone. Um, thioacetone is so incredibly smelly. Um, they once, uh, I think, broke a vial in a German laboratory and the nearby town had to be evacuated because people were fainting, um, vomiting, nausea, dizziness, uh, hyper-aggressive, went on for kilometers and had to be scrubbed because it stuck around. Real bad odor. Um, the worst odor in food is um, almost unquestionably something called surstroming. Have you heard of surstroming? I it's, um, don't think I have. Okay, so uh, I believe it's a Norwegian delicacy. It is where you get uh, fish, you put it in a tin, but you allow it to ferment in the tin. Um, the fermentation process produces a great deal of sulfur to the point where the tin actually expands from the outside. Um, it is very sulfurous. I would call it almost dangerous in some instances, especially if it goes off. I don't know how you can distinguish between when it's uh, okay or not. Um, and it is so horrifically bad. Um, it's been used in a lot of legal cases where someone has slipped and dropped a tin of surstroming um, at their apartment block and um, they've had to evacuate the apartment. <laughs> uh, it's illegal to take it on airplanes for any reason whatsoever. Um, so yeah, thoroughly unpleasant. What typically uh, Norwegians do is that they 
have a big bucket of water. They pierce the lid, allow all the odorant to come off, and then they can uh, enjoy their meal after that. So you've got to open it under the water to control the odour? Yeah, I mean, it'll control it to a point where it'll be somewhat tolerable as opposed to incredibly unpleasant because a lot of those a lot of those unpleasant chemicals they're quite uh, they're quite dense and so they'll just kind of float and stay in the water a lot of them won't a lot of them will go to the surface but it's it's acceptable <laughs> i suppose um oh, other interesting facts um there is a word for the smell of rain and this was invented by two australians um and it's called petrichor and petrichor is the um basically these little minute uh, microbes in asphalt and other things flying up and breathing with each other. And that is the smell of rain, petrichor. I believe you can actually grow them in a jar. Oh, you can probably grow them anywhere. I mean, <laughs> dig up a bit of soil and just um, yes. keep them around. They're very resilient to, um, to, uh, to uh, changes in humidity and that kind of thing. And, um, once they get a bit of water, they'll, they'll happily go for it. No problem there. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Um, yeah. So did you want to make a, a final statement or should I just thank you? Um, I, I suppose I would like to encourage people, if, if, if they want to, um, pay a little bit more attention to your sense of smell. If you're smelling something unusual, try and put a name to it. Try and describe what it is that you're detecting. And you'll find that, um, at least me personally, I found it to be kind of an enlightening experience as I'm walking around shopping aisles, as I'm uh, walking around streets. Even the unpleasant smells have their own qualities about them. And it kind of makes certain experiences for me um, a lot more immersive. Well, James Hayes, thank you very much. Oh, not at all. Thank you so much for having me. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was asking about the sense of smell going on and off because I've had that for about 17 years <laughs> since oh, I got okay. terror fish poisoning. Um, I don't even notice that it's missing until it suddenly comes back and I can smell again. And it's like, oh, yeah. What, what, what kind of fish poisoning is that? Oh, it's called ciguatera. It's a tropical oh, disease. Oh, tropical fish stuff. Out. Yes. Yes, that would have happened because... Um, because it's a neural based poison. Yes, I've heard yes. of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that'll just click on and off. Oh, it's that's terrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. And it's, yeah. it's really odd because you don't notice as much when your sense of smell goes yes. because it's an absence. But when it suddenly comes back, you're going, oh, <laughs> got about <laughs> well, that. <laughs> I won't go into details. That has to do with uh, something called olfactory adaptation and habituation. Uh, Really, really complicated cascades of uh, yes, hormones yeah. and stuff telling you, telling your body not to overdo it. But if your body isn't prepared, it'll hit you with those things really aggressively. <laughs> yes. So it's, it's an interesting experience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, so the sense of smell deteriorates as you age. Yes. Is there anything people can do about that? Or can you just increase your perception of it by training it or paying more attention? You can pay more attention to it. Um, a, a long time ago, what I, what I would have loved to do was conduct an experiment where you have people who are a little bit older and they're losing their sense of smell. Um, and as a result, they're not able to access those olfactory memories that we were talking about before. There would certainly be a way that we could artificially correct for that and improve and uh, enhance concentrations of particular chemicals that they're losing their ability to detect so they can get those olfactory memories back and improve their quality of life. Um, I think with an aging population, I think that's a really viable way of improving the lives of a lot of different people. Um, I would love to do it, um, but uh, I'd, we'll have to see where the funding comes from. <laughs> well, there's also, of course, industrial electronic noses. Yes. Um, now, my boss, um, Professor Richard Sturtz, who leads the Yoda Laboratory, he's done a lot of work with electronic noses. Um, electronic noses are valuable in certain circumstances, but they do have some pretty severe limitations, typically. Um, they're only able to detect a handful of odorants. Um, in industrial application, that's 
typically things like sulfur and other really strong odorants that people are going to be upset with. You can apply them to other experiences as well. Their detection ability is usually worse than humans. So they're valuable for detecting like gross odor viola uh, violations where things have gone very um, considerably wrong. But when it comes to like quite fine tuning things, they're not as useful. Um, the other problems are is that they're quite expensive. They require a lot of upkeep because again, like our noses, they're interacting with volatile chemicals all the time. Um, and so that'll degrade their ability, uh, their ability to detect things. Um, so yeah, I do feel that they have uses. Um, I don't think that the technology is there yet to really replace the human nose. I don't think it's going to be here for decades. Um, um, our best analytical machines um, in some instances aren't better than the human nose. And of course, I'm trying to think what else. Um, I saw something recently on they used to try having smell in movies and TV, smell a vision with little scratch and yes. sniff marks. <laughs> Do you know what um, I know a few things. So um, you can go past several, certain fast food restaurants in, here in Australia and the smell is unmistakable. I'm reasonably certain that they could change their practices, but they're not going to because people have that smell, they have that association and that's going to get more people in the door. Um, I have heard in America, they have um, billboards uh, advertising particular restaurants and they have these huge vats of chemicals with a big fan behind them. And they're just firing, um, I think it was a steak odor onto the highway just to get people hungry for steak. Now, as a strategy long-term, that's probably not gonna work very well. If, you have, if this is a road where people are just driving back and from uh, for work, eventually they'll just get used to it and it won't be something that they detect or care about anymore. Um, with regards to smell vision and things like that, I think there's a huge market for it. Um, I think doing it properly is very challenging because again, we're talking about a lot of different chemicals. You have to make sure that you're not offending anybody. Um, it's a hard thing to do. I recently helped out with an art installation um, in Sydney where um, there were different odors at different tables and they were encapsulating certain fields of um, Sydney in the 1970s. So uh, you would lift open this cup and there would be the smell of the Mardi Gras, for instance, or um, the smell of gum leaves and stuff. And that was, that was a very carefully thought out thing um, and very carefully organized. And that, that was a, that I, I, I personally had a fantastic time when I was there. Um, in regards to the closest thing to smell o vision that I've seen, um, if uh, you go to uh, Disney World over in the States, they have a, they have a couple of rides. Um, I think it's called like World Tours or California Tours or something like that. They put you in, um, uh, essentially, it's a, like a roller coaster scenario, but you're just in a building. You're not moving anywhere, but they pretend that you are by blowing air and you have a big screen in front of you and they also have odorants. So if you're going over a pine forest, they'll uh, fire pine scent out there. Um, if you're going into like the desert, they will try and recreate some of the odorants. But even then with a huge amount of money and a huge amount of technology behind uh, Disney, um, me personally, I was able to say, okay, this isn't quite the odor that I think that they were trying to do, but maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just a stickler for that kind of stuff. Um, for my personal interest, I think it would be very good for video games. I mean, we're looking at virtual reality at the moment. If we could somehow operationalize odors into video games, I think that would be a very immersive experience. Again, how to do it. I, I got some ideas, but nothing's really sticking as to being commercially viable. <laughs> I saw a few things suggested for computers where they had, instead of scratch and sniff, they had little USB devices that would put out a little set of different odorants at different times. But of course, you've got to refill it. I think they used yeah, to. Yeah. Yeah. You have uh, micro droplet systems where yes. you have a, a solid form of the odorant. It heats up, produces a small droplet and then fires off. You do have to refill it. And again, I mean, I, I think you could do about six odorants before it got too much. And six odorants isn't going to encapsulate a huge amount of stuff. So it, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Um, 
Is there anything else we haven't covered? Art, I mean, look, smelling art is a fascinating idea. <laughs> and I'm sure somebody will run with some, some other way of doing things. Uh, we could talk about honeybees, if you like. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so some of the technology we're working at. So honeybees, um, they do have pheromones. And their ability to detect, to detect things is astonishing. It, in some cases, even um, outperforms dogs um, by a wide margin. Um, when they're um, having their uh, yearly um, mating rituals, they will release very minute um, types of pheromone. They will be detected. Um, and, you know, we're talking not parts per trillion, parts per quadrillion, parts per as many zeros as you like to put behind it. Um, and that's quite fascinating. Uh, for my particular research, what um, we were looking to do is perhaps use something like an e-nose or some other form of technology where we could um, take air samples from the hives and then looking at the kind of chemical odors that they're emitting, um, translate that into saying, okay, this hive is healthy, or this hive has a particular mite, this hive has a particular disease. Um, and that would be very beneficial to um, apiarists around the country because um, otherwise what they have to do, they have to take the whole hive apart, that disturbs the hive. They're usually quite heavy. They weigh about 30 to 40 kilograms in some instances. Um, so we were looking at that as something viable. I think we're still going to try and go for it in some in some capacity because we think there's a there's a lot of um, potential there, um, and that kind of technology. I mean, starting from that form, I think we could apply it into rural considerations. If there's something wrong with a cow, or if there's something wrong with another kind, like a another type of insect or whatever it might be, that kind of technology can be easily adapted to say, here is an olfactory uh, response um, and we can say they have this particular uh, disease and this is the kind of treatment that we can prescribe. What we really like about that, of course, is that it's, um, it's uh, very non-invasive and uh, um, I'd love to see that in the medical field as well. I'm currently in, in the middle of writing a paper um, in that regard. Medical um, bees. Be... Sorry? Medical bees. Medical bees. Well, you have explosive detection bees, actually. I was about to ask about those. <laughs> <laughs> explosive detection bees are fantastic. So um, uh, what they do, they make, have a little cage with a bee in it at an airport. They are trained to detect um, explosive chemicals, and they have a high-speed camera right next to the bee. And depending on how far their tongue goes out, determines how close you are to the particular explosive components. And that is incredible. That that is that I'm 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 very happy that that exists in our world. <laughs> there, there must be so many applications. As you're saying, explosive detection. You could put them near landmines and all sorts of things. Yep. Um. Actually, they've trained a particular um type of rat to um detect landmines. The advantage of which, of course, is that unlike dogs, they won't trigger the landmines. Um, and they can point them out and uh, kind of dig them up for you as well, which is really beneficial. Um, other applications for um, olfactory industries, as I like to call them, um, lots of rare species can be detected by dogs. Um, recently with uh, koalas and a lot of uh, habitat loss, um, there's some great work being done up in Queensland to uh, um, collect uh, individuals. There is a lot of quarantine work that goes into sniffer dogs. Um, there, uh, I can't remember the name of the island, but there is a dog whose sole duty it is to ensure cane toads don't reach their shores. And he inspects every single ship, sees if there's any cane toads, and he moves on. And he detected one dead one once. Um, so obviously, shipping's doing something very good. And obviously, this dog is absolutely right on it, which is fantastic. Um, oh, dogs uh, in the past uh, detected estrus in cows. Um, so a whole heap of uh, different um, ways to use our sense of smell and it's, it's not invasive, um, it can be trained and uh, I, I think it has a lot of uh, implications uh, for the future. That's wonderful. So the reason that, um, well this is one of the main reasons and this is one of the main reasons I hate this particular philosopher 
Um, Aristotle called uh, the sense of smell the most base of all the senses, not worthy of our attention. And I think that's kind of translated throughout the ages. And I think he's got a lot to answer for. <laughs> um, later on, um, obviously, you had a uh, sense of smell used by uh, doctors and things to identify certain diseases and disorders. Um, the, uh, the example of, um, oh, I can't remember his name now, but his work uh, was uh, preceded by John Snow looking at the, uh, a particular pump that had typhus. And the idea at the time was that it was bad odors that were causing um, people to get ill and not the diseases themselves. So I'm not saying that um, your sense of smell is completely without fault. Um, it, was a, it was a dominant theory at the time that that was what was causing the bad things and that was just not the case. Um, and I think, I think recently uh, your sense of smell, because of its non-invasive quality, uh, will find itself in more applied to medical uh, issues. Um, there are things where um, they're taking these odorous compounds that we personally might not be able to detect. People are breathing into tubes and things like that. And you can say they have a particular lung cancer and things like that. My wife um, works at the Colling Institute and she looks at breath research and she doesn't look at VOC, she looks at proteins, but the uh, practice is quite similar. Um, so I think there's a lot of applications for the future. And if we can just shake off what Aristotle said all those years ago, I think we'd be a lot better. Um, I can give you some interesting facts if you like. I can oh, say sure. what the worst, worst odor of all time was. Yes. The worst odor of all time is something called thioacetone. Um, thioacetone is so incredibly smelly. Um, they once, uh, I think, broke a vial in a German laboratory and the nearby town had to be evacuated because people were fainting, um, vomiting, nausea, dizziness, uh, hyper-aggressive, went on for kilometers and had to be scrubbed because it stuck around. Real bad odor. Um, the worst odor in food is um, almost unquestionably something called surstroming. Have you heard of surstroming? I it's, um, don't think I have. Okay, so uh, I believe it's a Norwegian delicacy. It is where you get a uh, fish, you put it in a tin, but you allow it to ferment in the tin. Um, the fermentation process produces a great deal of sulfur to the point where the tin actually expands from the outside. Um, it is very sulfurous. I would call it almost dangerous in some instances, especially if it goes off. I don't know how you can distinguish between when it's uh, okay or not. Um, and it is so horrifically bad um, it's been used in a lot of legal cases where someone has slipped and dropped a tin of surstroming um, at their apartment block and um, they've had to evacuate the apartment. Uh, <laughs> it's illegal to take it on airplanes for any reason whatsoever. Um, so yeah, thoroughly unpleasant. What typically uh, Norwegians do is that they have a big bucket of water, they pierce the lid, allow all the odorant to come off and then they can uh, enjoy their meal after that. So you've got to open it under the water to control the odour? Yeah, I mean, it'll control it to a point where it'll be somewhat tolerable as opposed to incredibly unpleasant because a lot of those, a lot of those unpleasant chemicals, they're quite, uh, they're quite dense and so they'll just kind of float and stay in the water. A lot of them won't, a lot of them will go to the surface, but it's, it's acceptable, <laughs> I suppose. Um, oh, other interesting facts. Um, there is a word for the smell of rain, and this was invented by two Australians, um, and it's called petrichor. And petrichor is the, um, basically these little minute uh, microbes in asphalt and other things flying up and breathing with each other, and that is the smell of rain, petrichor. I believe you can actually grow them in a jar. Oh, you can probably grow them anywhere. I mean, <laughs> dig up a bit of soil and just um, yes. keep them around. They're very resilient to, um, to, uh, to uh, changes in humidity and that kind of thing. And um, once they get a bit of water, they'll, they'll happily go for it. No problem there. <laughs> Terrific. I, I suppose I would like to encourage people, if, if, if they want to, um, pay a little bit more attention to your sense of smell. If you're smelling something unusual, try and put a name to it. Try and describe what it is that you're detecting. And you'll find that, um, at least me personally, I found 
it to be kind of an enlightening experience as I'm walking around shopping aisles, as I'm uh, walking around streets, even the unpleasant smells have their own qualities about them. And it kind of makes certain experiences for me um, a lot more immersive. Well, James Hayes, thank you very much. Oh, not at all. Thank you so much for having me. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was asking about the sense of smell going on and off because I've had that for about 17 years <laughs> since oh, I got okay. terror fish poisoning. Um, I don't even notice that it's missing until it suddenly comes back and I can smell again. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> What, what kind of fish poisoning is that? Oh, it's called ciguatera. It's a tropical oh, disease. Oh, tropical fish stuff. Out. Yes. Yes, that would have happened because, um, because it's a neural-based poison. Yes, I've heard yes. of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that'll just click on and off.